This video is sponsored by the book summary app, Blinkist. The intimations of it can and do spur throughout the day, both subtle and explicit, often without our conscious awareness. Every sensation of hunger, every concern about our health, every passing siren of an ambulance, every tragic news story, every photograph of our younger self or the sight of someone aged into their last, the passing of dead trees in the midst of winter, that weird sensation waking up just following a nap or in between sleep states, all remind us in various ways that existence stands on a ground that can, at any uncertain moment, and certainly at some, be cracked open, dropping us down into the abyss of non-existence forever. Death is our lifelong opponent, always taunting us in the background, beating us up with each wrinkle, each gray hair, each stiff neck, and decaying function, if we are lucky and it is merciful enough to keep us around for a while. Like a tree, its roots sprawl down underneath existence, imperceptible to us on the surface, void of the explicit expression of our life, but yet is completely intertwined with it. Arguably, nearly everything we do is, in some sense, pressed up on by these roots. Our actions, our beliefs, our values, our goals, our life. In his book, The Denial of Death, 20th century cultural anthropologist and writer Ernest Becker argued that death, and more precisely, our denial of death, is the primary underpinning motivational force responsible for the majority of human behavior. As humans, one of the fundamental things that set us apart and forward amongst other earthly creatures is our unique ability to think conceptually. Becker argued, however, that although this in fact does set us apart and makes us feel as though we are special in some grand way, it does not actually make us so. Man is a worm and food for worms. This is the paradox. He is out of nature and hopelessly in it. He is dual, up in the stars and yet housed in a heart-pumping, breath-grasping body that once belonged to a fish and still carries the gill marks to prove it," Becker wrote. Consequently, humanity finds itself with a unique conflict, the juxtaposition of its awareness of itself and its condition, a living thing born to die like all other living things, and its lack of any reason or specialness to justify this awareness. Man is given no other significance or consolation for this burden he must bear. What does it mean to be a self-conscious animal? Becker writes. The idea is ludicrous if it is not monstrous. It means to know that one is food for worms. This is the terror, to have emerged from nothing, to have a name, consciousness of self, deep inner feelings, an excruciating inner yearning for life and self-expression, and with all this yet to die. It seems like a hoax. Whether we are aware of it or not, according to Becker, this terror of death, and more specifically, our denial of honestly responding to and accepting it is at the core of almost everything we do, and most of us are mostly unaware of it. The conscious mind cannot square the circle of the approaching abyss. It cannot make sense of the idea that this is its only serving of forever. In its inept confusion over its finitude into infinite nothingness, it fears it, it resists it, it uses the same conceptual capacity that allows it to comprehend its death, to contrive methods and explanations, to try to deny it. As Becker would refer to it, the individual undertakes a causa sui project, or heroism project, in an attempt to distract and deny against the implications of their mortality. We create and engage in symbolic constructs, cultural activities, and beliefs in an attempt to refuse our cosmic insignificance and convince ourselves that we matter. Becker suggested that people go about this a number of ways, depending on the person. For some, it is through religion. For others, it is through different means of cultural contribution and status, like fame, success in a career field or company, or the creation of things considered significant by culture. All methods, in some way or another, attempt to eternalize the self, either by a literal eternal afterlife, or by the displacement of the self through an eternalized legacy and significance in the world beyond one's physical existence. However, Becker essentially argued that ultimately all efforts towards this causa sui or heroism or immortality project are futile and destined to fail. With the belief of religious afterlives and solutions increasingly being eclipsed by modern knowledge and understanding, man finds himself unable to do anything ultimately significant or immortalizing as the universe is revealed to be utterly chaotic, indifferent, and meaningless. Becker offered no consolation in the way of resolving humanity's urge to heroism in conflict with its plight of insignificant finitude, because he did not believe there was any. And so, what does one do from here then? 
For Becker, it is not purely hopeless. What he offered, rather, was an alternative kind of heroism, characterized by a sort of honesty with one's condition, living with an intense humility and positive resignation to the awe and mystery and chaos of the universe and our insignificant position within it. This position, our absurdity, our victimization by our own death, can be transmuted in a way that does not deny it, but rather provides perspective, honest perspective that can reduce and numb one's concerns over the petty and trivial, potentially deviating or extending beyond Becker slightly. Perhaps the best one can do in the face of death is to use it to put the life they have into perspective. Perhaps we don't think about it enough, at least consciously, to properly make use of it, to strengthen the muscle of our mind enough to handle its true inevitable weight. Perhaps to consider somewhat often and hard that at some point none of this will matter and that it will all be lost shines a proportionally bright light on what does matter right now. When it comes to life and death, there are really only two certainties. You will die, but you are alive now. Whether you agree fully with Becker or not, whether you believe in some afterlife or grand meaning, this is all anyone can truly know, for sure. There is no telling if or what comes after death. There is no telling when it will come for you. But there is telling that you have life right now. To enjoy fully this moment now, as often as you can, in as many ways as you can. To fall in love with a person, a thing, a moment, yourself. To make the most of it all despite knowing that you will lose it all to nothing, is more than enough heroism. What's worse than to live a life knowing that one will die is to live a life knowing that one will die and not live as many moments as one can, properly relishing in the fact that they have not yet. At some point you will do everything for the last time. You will see your last sunset. You will taste your last bite of food. You will laugh your last laugh. You will see everyone you know a last time. You will do anything for a last time. You will be you for the last time. If there is nothing specific to be done, the only thing that truly matters is that we do what matters to us while we can. There is nothing else to do, nowhere else to go. We must charge headlong into the absurdity, embrace the futility, and live hard for nothing in every moment. One must be careful and mindful to not make the singularness of their shot at existence a pressure to get it all right, to do all the right things and think all the right thoughts and feel all the right feelings. The point is quite the opposite. You will mostly do a lot of the wrong things, think a lot of the wrong thoughts, and feel a lot of the wrong feelings. But precisely because this is your one shot at life, this must be okay. You are driving blind through the most impossibly complex, strange maze that you know ends in a head-on collision with the wall. What use is getting more upset or guilty about feeling upset or guilty in an existence that set you up? Of course, this is far easier said than done, but perhaps in true, deep contemplations of one's mortality, at least on occasion, this reminder can sometimes serve more as a sedative and not merely a stimulant. This video was sponsored by Blinkist. Of course, a life made and confined by time means that we both have a limited amount of it and have to spend it in every moment. Understandably, this can create an intense pressure for how we choose to do so. We can of course never fully do so perfectly, but the more methods and tools we can use to protect and optimize it, obviously, the better. Specifically, reading is both an extremely important and extremely difficult habit in this regard. Its value is immense, but it can generally be a slow and tedious spend of time. However, whether you're already a reader who wants to better optimize the habit, or someone who wants to start reading more in general, but has struggled to do so for this reason of time, the book summary app, Blinkist, helps solve these problems by allowing you to read and learn from far more books in far less time. Blinkist allows you to do this by condensing thousands of complete, non-fiction books into around 15-minute summaries, which can be both read and listened to even while offline. If you read just one hour per day and it roughly took you, as an average reader, about 1.7 minutes to read one book page, if you are reading a traditional, complete book, you would learn from only about 35 pages of the one book. With Blinkist, however, in that same hour, you would learn from about four complete books, extracting all the main ideas, overviews, and key takeaways in the same amount of time. Of course, you're getting condensed versions, but with the amount of time saved, you'll have all the more room and be all the better equipped to determine the right books and topics to go on and read more fully about. 
And now, for these cases, Blinkist also has full-length audiobooks that can be purchased directly within the app, as well as unique, consolidated summaries of popular podcasts. If you're interested in learning more about anthropology and the influence and effects of human behavior, Blinkist has excellent titles like Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari and The Third Chimpanzee by Jared Diamond, as well as many more in 26 other categories. The first 100 people to use the link in the description will receive one free week of unlimited access as well as 25% off a full membership. The free 7-day trial can be cancelled at any time within the trial period. And of course, as always, thank you so much for watching in general, and see you next video.